will share. Hello and welcome back to the Rams Writer Podcast. I am Simon, as usual, your host. Joining me today is a fellow Rams fan. He's also a host of Pub Talk Football Podcast. It's Regan Wilson. Regan, good evening, mate. How are we doing? Welcome to the show. Thank you for coming on. How are you doing? Privilege to be on, mate. Yeah, I'm all right. Enjoying the sort of emotional detachment, if you like, at the minute, the international break after shall we say, a manic couple of months for us Rams fans. I think it's nice for us to sit back and not really have any stress for a few weeks, to be fair. But then when you read FPLs, what's going on off the pitch, you sort of, that stress quickly comes back. But there you go. But yeah, nice to be on, mate. Ah, pleasure. Yeah, it has been a bit rubbish at the moment. So yeah, that basically what we're going to talk about today is just obviously... We started the season now, we're into the first month of the season and obviously, like I said, international breaks here, which is, do you like international breaks? You know, especially just, you know, we've just had the, the Euros, haven't we? And we're thinking, oh, an international break now for World Cup. Do you do you like them or was it? I mean, yeah, I do like them more. Most of the time I watched England games, but a lot of the time you're forcing yourself really, are you? Particularly yeah. after the Euros, we've come off such a big high of international football. Mm. I mean, are you really excited to watch England v Andorra tomorrow? Not really, no. no I mean, <laughs> it'll be on because yeah, there'll be nothing yeah. else on. You know, the missus it's all in the be, background, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. The missus will be in bed, like, because she's, she's, she's on nights now, so she'll be, she'll be in bed. So it'll be like, oh, I've got TV to myself. And I'll probably be literally on... The sofa, the England game will be on the background and I'll be there with like my phone, just like dibbling like Twitter and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I, I might take up gardening until Derby are back, mate, to be honest. If you are, mate, you can come <laughs> around mine and sort mine out. I've got a lot of work <laughs> he's doing. <laughs> right. Well, I hope you can pay me a higher wage than four and a half grand a week. Oh, you're pushing it there. You're pushing it, mate. I might be able to stretch to 4.6. <laughs> I'll sign but, for you instead of Derby then. Do it, mate, do it. Right, yeah, so Derby then. Season started okay, would you say? Would you say a season started okay? Um, I I think for me it started better than I expected. What about you? Yeah, to be honest, six points, five games, a win, three draws, one defeat. I mean, the defeat against Peterborough, we should have never, even if we only got a point in that game, it would have been daylight robbery really. So, it's a lot better than what I expected with all the negativity off the pitch. You know, going into the first game of the season, we could barely put a team together. We luckily managed to get Davis and Stearman in, so we had two centre-halves at the last minute. We then got Ravel. We've obviously later got Jackie Elker and Baldock, which is a massive plus. But I don't think I'd have expected it to be this good, to be honest. I mean, I know it's an average start in the grand scheme of things, but... My prediction going into that first game against Huddersfield was 3 0 Huddersfield. I just, I didn't fancy as I see the club in turmoil off the pitch and I thought it was going to carry into the season. You know, you've got to think we didn't have a senior centre back. So it's been better than what I expected. And I do think with the team we've got, I do think we're capable of staying up. It's whether, you know, if we get a points deduction, then it really does get worrying. Yeah, it does. I mean, like, yeah, you've, you nailed it there, to be honest. I think. I, I didn't have us down as losing to Huddersfield. I'm not sad. I, I just thought, you know, for the first game of the season, you know, especially this this season where obviously fans are back, you know, we're not, you know, we've had 18 months, two years or whatever it was without without being at the ground. Um, I just thought this, you know, the first game back, regardless of everything that was going off the pitch, I still thought we might just sneak a win. And I, you know, I've been shocked by it. I, I was sort of like getting a one or draw. I thought. You know what? On the on the on the basis of the game, watching the full game, I think a draw is probably a, a fair result. But yeah, I mean, yeah. obviously you mentioned it there. I mean, we've had eight players go out, um, so that's uh, Jack Marriott, Martin Wagon, Wisdom, Scott Malone, Jonathan Mitchell, Florian Yozovzun, Jordan Ivan, Scott Carson have all left. Mm. Um, I, I don't think no, no, none of them have gone for fees. <laughs> They've all gone on freebies, <laughs> so that's just nothing in for the club. Uh, and six in, as you mentioned, Phil Jagielka, Curtis Davis signed a new deal. Uh, Richard Stearman, Ravel Morrison, Sam Baldock, and Ryan Allsop. So, what 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 do you make of the transfer window? I mean, did you expect a great deal? Obviously, we're we're under a transfer embargo. Um, we'll get into that a bit later on in the show. But did you expect a lot of? Did you expect six signings at the start of the window? I don't know if 
if there was any logic behind it, but you sort of delude yourself into thinking, oh, it will sort itself out, you know, before the start of the season, the takeover will be sorted, we'll get some players in. But as the summer went on and it's getting close to the season and we're a couple of days out from, from Huddersfield and we've got no players in, mm. then, yeah, I'd, I'd have bit your hand off to get six players in by then. But, yeah, I, I did think that we might have been able to get a couple loans in before before the end of the window, maybe the embargo would be lifted more. But, but in the grand scheme of things, considering the circumstances, we've not done too bad, really. You know, in terms of the outgoings, there's probably only two there looking at it now that I'd like to have that wisdom, ideally, I would have kept. Mm. And, you know... Yeah, I'm a fan of I'm a fan of Waggy. I think he's probably a better striker than Sam Baldock. But the main thing about that is, like you say, all three transfers. Waggon, did we pay five million to Ipswich? Yeah. Gone for a free, you know. And this is this just stinks of Derby's business over the last few years under Mel Morris. You know, did we pay six million for Bradley Johnson? He went for nothing. We spent what three million on on Blackman. I can't remember what he went for, but it was a pittance of that and. Just shows how the club's been run. But yeah, in terms of the actual recruitment, I think it's nice to have well, Jackie Elk is 39 now, but mm-hmm. watching him the last few games, he looks absolutely class to me. Davis, if he can stay fit, still a very good defender at this level. And Ravel Morrison, let's hope that is the one who I'd really keep an eye on this season. I think, look, I've been a critic of Rooney's management in the past, but maybe he could be the, the right manager for Ravel to really bring the best out of him. Hope so. Yeah, it seems that way. I think out of all the all the players we've sort of brought in this season, I think, yeah, Phil Jagielka, I think a lot of people went, oh my God, he's almost 40, what we're bringing in for? Well, hello, that's this is all we can afford at the minute. I think we, you know, yeah. and you're thinking this is how bad things really are, is the fact that we're relying on a, on a 39-year-old centre-back to, to help us get through 46 championship games a season. But he's done, you, you, like you said there, he still looks a class act in, in, in this league. He's been... You know, he's not lost anything. I think with Jagielka as well, he's not... I think he's had a couple of, in his career, he's had a few knee injuries. But he's never been out for more than 10 games, which you think, well, for a career that spans over, what, six, 700 games, mm. that's not bad. You know, so he's obviously kept himself fit. I mean, you look at him, he's, he's older than Rooney. He looks younger than Rooney, doesn't he? You know, let's, let's be honest. <laughs> you know, you're thinking, Rooney's 35, he's 39. He's like, what? Has, has Ronaldo's older than Rooney. I know, it's so... Yeah, but Ronaldo's a different specimen, isn't he? He's not human, is he? Let's be honest. Um, and, but yeah, I think you're right. Ravel Morrison, for me, was the signing of the seat of the summer for us. Um, I think he's come in, you know, no one... Not no one, but a lot of people wrote him off and went, well... He's been here, there and everywhere. A bit of a journeyman, if you like. Never really settled at a club. Bad attitude, all this. But I think I think he's he's, he's basically clung on to Colleen Kazim Richards, I've been told. You know, and I think he's sort of mentoring him and they get on really well. And you see, you see Ravel Morrison with the younger lads as well on the pitch. He's a leader out there for him. You know, he's shouting him, telling him what to do. And amongst that as well, you know, he's, just, he's so good on the ball. I think he really is very good on the ball. His first touch and everything. He's got a few little tricks in him. Him and uh, Tom Lawrence linked up so well against Nottingham Forest. And I think if we can bring someone like Jozviak into that as well, they need to link up with him as well because he is another man that this season that a lot of people have had doubts about him, about his form, you know, uh, last season. At the start of this season as well, he wasn't great. But he seems to be, have turned a corner now. And I think when we've got some, you know, attacking threat of the likes of Ravel Morrison, Tom Lawrence, Kamal Yozviak, you're thinking, you know what, yeah, this team actually can create and can get goals. I mean, we've scored what in every game apart from one now this season, which was something that we couldn't do last season. Now we need to improve on that. Now we need to take that one step further and score two goals in a game, not just the one goal. Because I think at the moment, that's that's our downfall at the moment. Like you said, against Peterborough, we won it up, didn't really look under any pressure, bang, two goals very late on, we lose the game. Nottingham yeah. Forest, again, Early lead, 10 minutes in, 83, 84 minutes, was it something like that? Bang. Goal. Again, you know, and we had plenty of chances against Nottingham Forest to, to finish that game off and come away with the three points. But instead, because we're not finishing games, because we are lacking, I feel one thing that was, I feel we lacked in this in this transfer window is, is a striker. I know we bought in Sam Baldock, but I just feel now that Kazim Richards out long, is out long-term injured, we... 
is Sam Boldock going to replace him? We've only got Jack Stratton that's a recognised striker now in the squad as well as Boldock. Boldock's injury record isn't great. He's injured again already. You know, so we end up playing Tom Lawrence up top against Nottingham Forest. And you're thinking, we really, really, really could have done with a striker on deadline day. And, you know, nothing came about. And I think Rooney made it clear on deadline day that no new signings would come in. He made, he said on uh, following the, uh, the Forest game that there was no new signings going to come in. And I still think everyone thought that actually there might be somebody. Did you think there might be somebody? Were you disappointed that we didn't bring at least one more person in? Obviously, we're under this embargo, so we can only have a squad of 23 registered players. So it would have meant one out and one in. So mm. I, I think, you know, there was the only rumour I really saw about somebody going out was David Marshall, obviously playing at number three at the moment. Um, some people, again, don't agree with that. But, you know, at the end of the day, for me, I think he's potentially at that time of his career now where he's 36, I think he is. Is he sort of looking at the the likes of what Carson and, and, and Lee, uh, Lee Grant have done, going, I'm happy being the third choice keeper now. If I can, I'll move on to a bigger club. You know, if not, I'll stay here. And if you need me, then I'll play if I'm needed. If, if not, I'm not too bothered. Yeah. He's so, linked to Liverpool, wasn't he? I mean, yeah. That'd be great. It's like Scott Carson and Man City. It's a nine-to-five job, Monday to Friday. You turn up to training, you go home, have a glass of wine or whatever in the evening. Don't matter. You're not going to play on a Saturday. If, as you're getting on in, in your career, when you get into that stage, then it don't really matter, does it? I mean, no. picking up a decent wage, you've got a good lifestyle, playing for a big club. The only thing is, obviously, he was still playing for Scotland in the summer, so... Mm -hmm. I don't think he's. Was he in the? Is he in the squad at the minute? I've not really looked. I've, I've, I've not looked. I don't. I'm not sure to be honest. Um, mm. I, I, normally, Derby put a thing up, don't they? When, when one of the players is on international duty, I saw him do it with uh, Yozdat, but I've not seen him say David Marshall is going away. I know Ravel's gone uh, away with Jamaica, but yeah, I don't know if he's, he's gone away or not. But but this is what I mean. You know, he's he's a goalkeeper now that he's done it. I suppose he's done everything he sort of can. You know, he's, he's played international football at you know, uh, the knockout stages of a of a European final, you know, does he need to, to play anymore? Because if one of his goals was to play for Scotland in the Euros, he's done that now. Yeah. As a goalkeeper at 36, what more is he going to achieve? One thing I'll say is um, I wasn't that impressed with him last season, but I haven't been impressed with all Sop at all in these two cup games. I think there's three goals in them two games he could have prevented. But in terms of Roos, I'm actually with you in, I think, the small minority of the fan base think it's fair to say that's fully behind him. Now, the goal on, on Saturday, last Saturday, he probably could have done better with. But mm. overall, this season, I think Keller Roos has been absolutely fantastic in that for us. Against Middlesbrough, he won us that point. Against mm. Hull, he made a couple of crucial saves. And also that save from Fraser Campbell against Uddersfield. Mm. That won us the point that day, make no mistake about it. And I thought, towards the end of last season when he came in. I didn't really think he, he let us down either. Except that one game, was it the Cardiff game where we lost 3-0 and he was at fault for a couple I, of the goals. I, I, but... I see, yeah, that Cardiff game, I don't think he was really at fault. A lot of people said he shouldn't have conceded that fourth goal because of how far out it was. And But at the end of the day, he's been told to play higher up in his box. So normally yeah. a goalkeeper then, you know, it, you're looking at standing what? Maybe about three or four yards off your line as a, as a standard sort of positioning wise, you know, and the further up the pitch the ball goes, the further out you go. That's why David Marshall got lobbed. He was mm. so far up the pitch because essentially his job is if the ball gets not long, there's somebody there cleaning up if it's in behind the defence. He can there clean up and, and get, you know, keep possession basically. Sweet. However, he was far too high up. He should have never been that high up. He was too far. He should have been a little about 10 yards back. Um, but yeah, that, that goal against Cardiff, that fourth one, that, that absolute, you know, rocket that was, I spoke to a, a goalkeeping coach about this and I, I wanted some clarity because I said to him, look, I didn't think he was at fault for that goal. Was he too far off his line? And he said to me, he says, no, the reason why he was, he was so far, because I think if you look at it, he was about six, seven yards off his line. He's basically he's playing a high ball. He's 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 up he's up high because he's playing this keeper this sweeper keeper role. So he's got to stay high in his box. So he's there available for a ball if someone needs to come back. He's done that. He's moved the ball forward and he's not expected. Was it, um, I can't remember who lost it now. 
was it Clark? Possibly Clark. I can't remember. Yeah, from memory. Yeah, um, they've lost it, and then bang, shot straight away. So he's out of position. That's not his fault. He did. He, you know, he's he he didn't anticipate them losing the ball like they did because we lost the ball very very softly. And you know, it's just it's one of them. The guy, you know, he's taken a strike and it's 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 wiggled in the air a little bit. And you've got to applaud the strike on that one for me. But yeah. This this whole debate, Ruse, Marshall, Allsop, you know, who's our number one? You know, I, for me, like I said, Allsop, every t- you know, I've seen him against Salford, main era there, uh, against, um, oh, who have you just said? Sheffield United. Sheffield United, I knew it was a Sheffield one. Could have <laughs> saved both of them goals. The, the first one, I mean, that's just, my keeper at Sunday League level would save that. Mm. He really would, Simon. It's terrible. He's, he's just got to save that. Mm. And the second one, I mean, it's an awful back pass from McDonald, but he just stands there on his line. He should be charging out for that when he sees Billy Sharp closing him down. He's got to be way quicker off his line for me. Yeah, yeah I'm not really convinced of him. But Roos, I mean, I just think, Simon, a lot of our fans, they made their mind up on him at Wembley a couple of years ago and, and they'll never change it. Richard Keogh got sort of the same treatment for a lot yeah. of years, really. But, I mean, he can't win with some of our fans. I mean, where I was sat for the Forest game, they're slating him all game for playing out from the back, which is what he's been told to do by the coaching mm. self, clearly. And then when he smashed it along a couple of times and we're coming under pressure, oh, all right, you've done, he smashed it up the pitch. Well, that's what you want him to do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, ex- just... ex- exactly. Yeah, I know what you're saying. I mean, granted, some of his... Some of his distribution against Forest wasn't great. Let's be honest. There was a lot of balls going out. Not ma- You can see our tactics. Our tactics are simple. It's attack the left-hand side. It's put long balls up to Forsyth or Buchanan um, for, for him to head on and, and hopefully one of the stri- one of the front men to get, get onto it. Now, when, you know, Ruse has got the ball at his feet, I- I'm confident when he's got the ball at his feet. I've got no, no worries at all. You know, he seems very confident with the ball at his feet. It doesn't really make me get nervous or anything. Um, but his clearance in wasn't great, but he was being put under pressure an awful lot. It wasn't as if these ones that were going out were ones where it was just an easy, simple, you know, knock a ball long. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. that. He was being put under immense amount of pressure from, especially Lyle Taylor in the first half. Uh, and again, in the second half, you know, he was being charged down, you know. And I think for him, if if he's not got to think about put, banging a ball long, he's fine. When he's got that pressure... Yeah, you will. You know, at the end of the day, this 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 whole new way of playing that teams are trying to uh, incorporate, you know, playing out from the back, using your keeper as an extra player, it, it's dangerous. And for me, it's silly. When you're a goalkeeper, you you, you you sort of go, I'm a goalkeeper. I'm here to stop shots, claim mm-hmm. crosses. That's my job. Not play tippy-tappy football from the back. Are we, are we going to do that with David Marshall as well? No, of course we're not. He's, you know... <laughs> yeah, I can't, I can't see us doing it with Ryan Allsop. This is why Scott, a reason why Scott Carson left. Because he couldn't yeah. do it. Yeah, he, He's not comfortable with the ball at his feet. You know, that's why he was dropped by Frank Lampard, one of the reasons why. You know, so you, I think we need to cut Keller Ruiz some slack. I know a lot of fans will never accept him, and that's fine. You're all entitled to your own opinion. But again, you mentioned it there. This is, this is literally Richard Keogh part two. You know, he made that massive howler that cost us at Wembley. Therefore, he cannot, you know, he, he will get the tiniest error. He will be nitpicked. I mean, you know, by the, by the whole, by a lot of the fans. And it's going to take him, you know, I think Keogh never really recovered from that until the playoff final again. Well, until the season under Lampard. I think yeah, that's yeah. when fans were, okay, yeah, this is, this is Richard Keogh. I like this Richard Keogh, you know. With Ruse, again... It's exactly the same thing. He gets everything is micro micro analyzed by people, by fans. Oh, we could have done better there. Yes, the goal. There was a there was countless and there was countless um, errors in, that led up to that goal. The shot, what the, the, the cross wasn't stopped. Shinny went out jumping and, and trying to head a thin air. There was a tug on uh, I think Stretton by um, Joe Worrell, which took him off. Forsyth came out, then went back again. Buchanan left his man at the back post. The shot criminal itself, that, hey, that was criminal that from Lee Buchanan. I thought leaving Brennan Johnson completely. I mean, he gets attracted to to. Uh, I think I think it was Graben. Mm. Leave that to Jaggy Olker. Or leave that to Forsyth. If they can handle him. He's yeah. he's surrounded by players anyway. Brennan Johnson stood there in about ten yards of space. We've seen yeah. how good he's been at the start of this season. Yeah, and that, yeah, okay, Ruth should that, save it, but he shouldn't get that chance. 
I've looked at it and looked at it and looked at it, and it, it's one of them shots that it's low, it's very hard, and it gives you a split second to make a decision if you're going it with your feet or with your hands. If you yeah. go with your feet, if he goes with his feet, he's saving that. Because he's gone with his hands, he's had to get down, so it's taken him a second longer to get down, which is why it's gone under his body. But as a goalkeeper, that's a decision you've got to make. You know, and I think if you ask any any goalkeeper, any I've, I've, again, I spoke about it as my goalkeeping coach. He said, "Yeah, he should have done better," but ultimately, these things happen. Yeah, as a goalkeeper, you will make a mistake. These things, David Marshall made plenty of mistakes last season. Not oh, yeah. I mean, look, he should do better, but he's done far more good than what I mean. That's really his own, the only downfall. Say if he doesn't make that save against Grabbin two minutes earlier. Mate, six yards Ruse, out, Grabbin gets a flick, sends Ruse. Well, Ruse is going the opposite way, and he's, he's at full stretch, saves it. That yeah. goes in, that's one all. And I think Derby will crack under the pressure, and I think Forrest go on and win that game. And that was never a corner, by the way, because I could, like, where I was sat, I could see straight down the line. It never went out. Did it not? But no, no, never in a million years. But on Roos, look, that's the only mistake he's made this season. Now, I'll, I'll sum it up like this. If we had. People who maybe want Marshall or all sopping goals, number one. We probably lose to Woodersfield. We probably only get a point against Hull. And we definitely lose to Middlesbrough without Roos in goal, in my opinion. So be careful what you wish for, really. Roos, for me, against Middlesbrough was a strong contender for man of the match. He made some... He was my man of the match. Three or four vital stops against yeah. Middlesbrough. You know, he was... He he tried to as well, which is something I've never seen him do before. But he tried to um, uh, to, to bully Ike Piazu. and I mean, as in give him a few little bumps and knocks off the ball, mm. just to let him know you might be a big guy, but I don't really care. That's something that he's you know he's a <laughs> for me that's something he has to has to continue to do is be aggressive, work on his aggression, let. Strikers know that he owns that box. You look at some of the top keepers. Peter Schmeichel, horrible person to play against because he lambasts his defenders, but also do it to the opposite team. Oliver Kahn, yeah. another one, great keeper. Absolute brilliant, brilliant keeper for Germany. Horrible because he's noisy. He looked angry all the time. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? You know, so that, that's what I'm talking about, aggression. They were very, very aggressive, very good keepers because they didn't really... You know what I mean? They they didn't care about who, who they were shouting at, and it was ne it was never going to be their fault if a goal was scored because there's eleven me uh, ten men that that ball's will get past before it goes in the net. But it's even like you look at Edison at City. If you're a striker, you're thinking, do you know what? I'm not going for this header in the six yard box. It'll take me freaking head off. He will. He's exactly. Yeah. He will come out all fist flying. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I think yeah, if, if Roos can continue with that aggression, he'll be fine. You know, I, I don't. I, yeah, there, there's he has made mistakes in the past. We can't, we can't, you know, we can't can't say he's not because he was very poor. I think under Koku, I, I, mm -hmm. I generally feel he didn't start the season great. But actually, I think he started all right, but then he seemed to decline at a rapid, rapid yeah. sort of rate. Yeah. And you've got to right. be bad to lose your place to Ben Amer. Yeah, exactly. He was, he was, I think he was rightfully dropped after that Fulham game. Um, I think he was feeling the pressure as well from the fans um, because of Wembley still. That was the first season back from Wembley. He's now starting number one after making that error. And it's like, right, okay. You, you know what I mean? Any any tiny mistake, he would be criticised. It would be blown up. But obviously, Hamer was then just as bad, if not worse. He came in, I think Hamer did, and he was, he was all right. Ruse obviously then gets his place back. And you know what? He looked very assured come the end of that season. And then I think, you know, last season... I didn't think, you know, when, when we signed Marshall, I did wonder if, you know, if it was going to be to replace Ruse, as in if it was if it was going to be for the number one spot, if it was going to be number two to Ruse. And then obviously it turns out it was number one. And then, oh, look, Ruse is back in. The managers hmm. must be seeing something in him to keep putting him in. Yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, that's Lampard, Koku and Rooney. It's three managers. Oh, so, okay. Look at Koku chopped and changed at times. Rooney did the end of last season, but at the end of the day, all three of them have rated Carl Roos as a goalkeeper. And at one point or another, see him as their number one. So, especially when you think we've had David Marshall, who's an ex Premier League goalkeeper, Scott Carson, who was very good for us for two or three years, 
he can be a mug. Well. <laughs> exactly. He's, he's playing for Man City now. I know he's only third choice, but you yeah. still can't be an absolute pile of crap to be Man City third choice. Of course, can't. So at the end of the day, Kellarus can't be either to be recognised as our number one by three different managers. Yeah, exactly. So I think, you know, like I say, I think the thing fans I mean, we need to we need to lay off a little bit. I mean, to be honest, uh, had that had that goal gone in against anybody else, I don't think it would have been a major issue. Mm-hmm. I, I, yeah. You know to I me, mean? I think it would have been forgotten about. But for me, yeah, Keller Roos is, is, is done absolutely fine this season. I think he, he hopefully he will grow and become better and better as the season goes on. You know, because uh, it's clear that Marshall Marshall won't be playing. <laughs> he won't. He, he will not be playing for Derby you know, again, unless he comes in FA Cup or something like that. But you look at that as well. You know, even the cup games, he's not been on the bench, so it just goes to show that he's obviously, you know, people, you know, he's obviously maybe he said to Rudy that he doesn't want to play. You know, he's not not too yeah. let him sit on the bench for, or not even sit on the bench, but he's getting paid to train, and, and that's about it. So, at the end of the day thirty six. If he's not bothered, he's not bothered. We can't force him to play. He's got a year left on his contract. So it, it is what it is. I suppose we can't do anything about it. So it would have been nice to get rid of him and obviously get a striker in. I mean, there's plenty of them out there that are free transfers at the moment. Dean, uh, Dean I keep doing this. Daniel Sturridge, Wilfred Boney, uh, Andy Carroll, you know, just to name three. I mean, would you take any of them? Andy Carroll, I don't think so. Just pure because of his injury record. Sturridge or Wilfred Boney. I can't say the signings that would exactly get me running around the house celebrating, but you'd definitely take a gamble on them because the quality they've shown in the past, if we could give them a run of games, possibly. But let's just hope in January we can actually do a little bit of business. As you say, even under embargo, if we'd been able to shift Marshall, it would have been nice to free up a space and bring another player in. Yeah, it would have been. Shame, really. Shame, really, isn't it? But yeah, <laughs> but yeah I mean... Overall, though, start of the season, six points, 15th in the league. I'd take that. I'd take that at the end of the season. That's where I've put us at the end yeah. of the season, to be honest, is yeah. that, sort, that sort of area. You know, we're not, I don't, like I say, I think we're strong enough to go, to stay up. But obviously, we're not strong enough to be chasing players or anything like that. Um, but I do feel that something, though, the only way we're going to stay up and keep like that is if we get, reinforcements in January and of course that means this off-field horseshit excuse my language that's going on has to come to an end yeah so let's sort of recap where we are so I'm under transfer embargo because of the following reasons because they're basically <laughs> not submitted accounts to the FL we assume they are the 90, well, well, five years worth of accounts, 16, 17, 18, 9, 20. Not submitted to the AFL, apparently. This is what's on the charge sheet. Not submitted accounts to company's house. Not paid a HMRC bill. And now we've not paid a transfer fee, which one can only guess is Christian Bielik. Obviously, he was bought over, I think, was it a four year deal, five year deal? Four years. Four years. So you're looking at what? If we're doing it, if we're paying them over those four years, you're looking at around about two and a half million, I would say. I, I, I'd assume it'd be something like that. Um, so we're under a transfer embargo. Now, as well as that, we've had the, the court cases regarding our amortization policy. That's come to an end, sort of. Well, it has. Then, you know, we've been charged fined under that £100,000. Um, some agree with it, some don't. Looking, I've looked and looked through the, the, the court and appeals and bored myself senseless with them. But essentially then we got, we, we, the reason for it was because the accounting practice doesn't stand, go with the FRS 102 accounting procedures, whatever that means, which I think is obviously a standard accounting practice. Um, you can't really, how can you say this is going to get you this much in so many years? Um, because you just don't know an injury, all of a sudden that player's value drops, you know, anything like that. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's complicated, but I think it should have been dealt with a lot better with from the AFL. You know, I look at the notes and we did apparently tell them about the amortization, but in the minutes of the meeting that we told them, it wasn't made clear what we were doing. So yeah, there's a lot of 
very amateurish stuff going on between both parties, not just the AFL but Derby as well. There's a lot of people at stadiums singing "fuck the AFL." They might as well. However, the, the plot thickens when you read that you know from Alan Nixon from the Suns reading saying that Derby are owed a transfer payment from somebody else. What well, they've done put under a embargo. It sounds like an AFL club as well. Yep. Yep. Then I've read today that we actually we're the only people that owe somebody uh, money. Um, I read that from FL22, who actually for some reason managed to do get some stories. So, uh, sorry, FL72. Yeah, they do actually get some stories. I think they broke the Marshall story before everybody else did. So, it's just a, 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 a shit storm, I suppose. Um, obviously, there's this takeover that you know we've heard about. Mel Morris has mentioned in this meeting with the supporters group. Um, we just don't know what's going on in this club and there is no communication whatsoever. And you, we, I think a lot of people have heard how I feel. I've, I've mentioned it on Radio Derby, etc. So, Regan, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you a chance now to tell me how you feel about all this nonsense that's going on at Derby County. How long have we got? Where do you start? How much you want, mate? I mean... On the amortisation thing, I found it quite interesting. Now, I know what we did isn't officially against the rules in terms of the Correct, way we yeah. amortise the players' values, but it still seems such a crooked way to do business, even though it's technically legal. I was like, if I'm employing you and I'm paying you, I don't know, £300 a week, now technically I could say to you, well, I'm not going to pay you weekly or monthly, Simon. I'll give you it all in a lump sum at the end of the year, which means you won't have any money all year, but you will get it at the end of the year. It's just not the way you do business, is it? No. In terms of the EFL, yeah, they've clearly got it in for, I wouldn't say the club, I'd say Mel Morris at this point. And this is why, mm. if this takeover, that I can't bother talking about takeovers, to be honest, but as soon as the club's, in different hands, the better, the sooner the better, should I say? Because, as I say, they've, they've dug the they've dug the heels into the sand, and I think Mel's doing the same now. They've clearly got it in for Mel, and it's it's not good for the club. I think probably we're going to be looking at a points deduction coming at this rate. Mm. Uh, as you say, with this um, with this instalment we've apparently missed, maybe it's the case where we're the only club in the division that's actually missed a certain date that we was meant to pay an instalment, as you say, probably for Bielik to Arsenal or maybe Yosvyat to, yeah, yeah, to, yeah, to yeah, let Poznan we brought him from. Yeah. 2.5 million. But yeah, I mean, the frustrating thing is, us as a fan base, look, we know it's a business. We know all football clubs now. It's not, let's face it, it's not the working man's game anymore. It is a business. It's a massive business. You look at we're so shocked that Curtis Davis is only on four and a half grand a week. Now that's a lot of money, but for a footballer, especially going down from 30 grand a week, it's it's crazy money really. But as I say, it's a business, but we're Tret as customers. We're not actually Tret as fans. And there's no, you know, the odd time is that there's a statement that's put out through supporter groups or on forums. But when was the last time we actually hear from Mel Morris properly? From memory, was it was it when we signed Rooney? That was August 2019, yeah. mate. That's two years ago since we've heard from the guy who owns our club. He was meant to be Derby through and through. You know, you cut him open, he's, he bleeds Derby. Well, he doesn't care about the Derby fans, does he? Clearly. He no. can't that much because we're just... We're just left in the loop. We don't know what's going on. We don't know what the future of the club is, what what hands the club going to be in, what division are we going to be in because we're a points deduction, even if it's only six points. I would really worry, to be honest. And, it, you know, it's frustrating, Simon, because we're still being under our own embargo because of all this stuff that's going on. I look at this team now. I think we've got a good team. Like, starting level, when everyone's fit, we've got yeah. a good team. But there's no depth there. You look at the bench, we're having to rely on... Some, you've got very talented youngsters, don't get me wrong, but can you rely on these young kids week in, week out? Mm. Now, in normal times, if we could add another three or four players, maybe we could have a squad where we could look to potentially challenge for playoffs. But yeah. we were still speaking off there about this whole takeover situation. And I just have a rotten feeling that this is going to drag on all season, really, with a dark cloud over the club. And I just pray to God that it doesn't lead to a points deduction and ultimately 
has ended up in League One because of this piss poor ownership. How we've been run for for years, really, we've been running to the ground. And but when we've been doing well under McLaren, and <clears throat> that's coming back a good few years, but under Lampard, would be a better example. Seeing as that's only two years ago, would you believe, or a little bit more? You, you don't think about this. It's not making headlines, and it's not at the forefront of your mind because the boys are doing so well on the pitch. You, there's 27, 28,000 every week cheering the boys on, getting to playoff finals and you don't actually have time to sit and think about how poorly the club's run because when you see how well we're doing, the excitement, it it clouds your judgment. But mm. now, the last 18 months, particularly the last 12 months, you see what a terrible state the club's in and and for folks like me and you who do believe Derby through and through, unlike Mel Morris, I'm going to say at this point, it's it's saddening to be honest. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree. It, it's oh, there's, there's just there's obviously a lot of a lot of people, you know, a lot of fans express their anguish. You know, a lot of, a lot of people still defend Mel Morris. That's that's fair enough. That's that's you know that's their prerogative. Um, again, it. it you know, you, you that that that, 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 that that I have you know I, I, I have had it confirmed from I have had it confirmed that what Nixon put about the um, Derby being owed a payment by someone was true, mm. um, and that's that that's come via someone via the club, um, and you think okay, right, fair enough, well. You can see that Derby have got a point now. Why? Why we've we been treated different to other clubs. However, could it be? Could it be the fact that let's deflect? Obviously, I. I but I think I, I would. I would assume that the club see the. Well, they, they will. They, they, obviously, the DCFC official account gets absolutely hammered every time they put something out that isn't a transfer, isn't a takeover, isn't communication with the fans, isn't season tickets, isn't this, isn't that. They get hammered. So. The club will know, or I keep saying the club. We'll, we'll say Mel Morris and Stephen Pearce. They're, let's, they're running the club at the minute, right? Um, they they they'll know how the fans feel. They'll see or they'll see or hear about how the fans are feeling regarding the state of the club. So when would they see a charge put up? Why not just go? Well, actually, Alan, a club owes us. That's why we've not yeah. paid a club because you know what I mean. All of a sudden, fans go see that. Well, EFL have got a vendetta against us. Let's, you know, let, let, let's, you know, they're just trying to boil our piss now. You know, let, let's rub it off against the the EFL. You know, so it it, it could have been that. Fact. Yeah. And when when I see the you know when I see that story about um, actually no 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 club owes Derby any money, you're thinking, okay, that 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 theory comes a little bit true. So. You know, when we've hit, we, the problem is, is the communication's awful. Now, I know there was this chat with the supporters group. They had to sign an, an undisclosure agreement. They did release, you know, some stuff. Um, Chris Cole was a week before. He also, you know, I think, I believe he had a chat with Stephen Pearce. No cash flow issues. Clubs are in run fine. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All of a sudden, we've not paid someone's bill. Who's lying? Because it ain't, it's not going to be Chris. He, all he's going to be doing is reporting what Stephen Pearce is saying. And to be honest, those those supporters groups that went, this is where I feel that they need to do a little bit more when we see charges come on. I've got no problem with them whatsoever. You know, they went to this meeting, they had to sign an NDA. You know, they can't discuss any more than what they've told us. Mm. But what I feel they need to be doing now is pressuring the club because the club seemed to say, well, say, I need to stop saying the club. Mel and Anita and Stephen Pierce seem to talk to them. You know, can they not push again? Look, why is there another charge come up? Can is, can you tell us about this? You know, is it true? You know, I'm not asking for us to say, you know, who do we owe and what do we owe? But can we? are we going to pay it? You know, are we doing everything we can to get us out of this transfer embargo? Those are the questions that, I'd want answer in. And for me, that's where I feel the supporters groups could help potentially, you know, by going back in at Mel, going back in at Stephen Pierce and, and firing these questions because they did it before. 
that you know they got they got a lot of fans to sign um a letter and all of a sudden Mel goes, Oh yeah, we'll have a meeting. Um so it, it it's it at the moment, you know, as fans can't do anything. The only thing, you know, there's now talk, so I obviously said this as well, about protesting. And it, yeah. it doesn't, and, it, and the, the problem is, is we're a split decision here. Do we protest and, you know, potentially distract the players or, or not? And this is, this is the problem because I don't want to affect the players if a protest is done, but it's, no, you can, you can no. protest, but not affect the players. This is what I'm saying. There was a, I, I suggested it, you know, we could, I, this was, this was a suggestion thrown at me, but turn your back on Mel for a minute or two as a protest. Everybody in the stand just turn your back on him uh, like on the 84th minute or something like that. 84 has been a significant number because of 1884 when the club was obviously founded. That's not going to put the players off because the fans have been absolutely incredible since we've come back. They've got behind the team but I think better than we have done when there was 27, 28,000 of us there. Oh, yeah, 100%. That's and the only problem with, with that is I'm behind it in principle. But if it's 1-1 one, one, or if we're 1-0 down or we're chasing the game, 84th minute, would you turn your back if we was on the attack and we was looking like we was about to score? <sighs> well, that's it, isn't it? It's one of these. You've got to be what's right for you. You know, we've got to try and convince 20,000 people to just turn the back on the fans. I mean, and again, if you're, you know, if you're two nil, three nil down or something daft like that, makes perfect sense. If you're two, one up, yeah. three or two nil, three nil up, it sort of doesn't because you're going, so it's, a, you know what I mean? So it's a difficult one because, you know, I mean, one of the things obviously that came out, the supporters group thing that was that if, oh, if, if, crowd started chanting at me to go, I'd walk, I'd leave you. Well, right. Do, so what you try, are you now saying, are you now threatening the fans? Yeah, you tell me you want me to go and I'll bugger off. I'll leave the club in the shit. Well, Mel, what you're doing now is leaving the club in the shit. Do you know what I mean? <clears throat> we saw that Al Jazeera documentary come out and he said then he's got £150,000 worth of loan, worth of debt in the club. £150,000. That was filmed, what, 2018-19? What's it at now? 18. No, 19, I think. Yeah, it was. The Lampard left. The Lampard, yeah. So that's two years ago. What's the debt like now? Surely, if you're 150,000 <laughs> then, what's it now? Because we've spent more money since then. I really don't want it now. Do you know what, Simon, as well? Just thinking about your theory about PR from Mel, about whether other clubs there was money. Who have we really got money more money from? for transfers in the last couple of years, what player would we still be owed money for from the last three or four years? The only sort of one, I mean, I, I looked at last year's and thought, Whitaker for Swansea, what, 750k? Are they really going to wear his money? Mm. Um, Evans from Millwall. I don't know. I think it was about 500k. Are they going to wear us any money? Or a million or something like that? It wasn't much. Are they really going to owe us money? Doubt it. The only really one that I think that suits or fits was Lowe and Bogle from Sheffield United. Yeah, maybe it was out 11 million for them too. Yeah, yeah maybe. I mean, I'm right. finished with Max Lowe now, by the way. Now he's gone to Forest. But, um, yeah, it, like I said, that, that theory probably holds some water, to be honest, because it, mm. it does deflect and it's working. There's been no sort of... I can't remember any any chanting against Mel Morris at all this season. Obviously, we uh, fought the AFL every game, which I'm not going to lie, joining on because I do think they're, they're a, a bent organisation. But, I mean, well, I'm, I'm fully behind any, any protest, to be honest, against the ownership because you're right, the club has been running to the ground, but it's got to be well organised. Mm. And it's got to be in a way where, you know, I completely agree we're not, actually turning our backs on the players like, literally or figuratively I don't I just think that as you say the support's been so good this season and then players I tell you what for all the crap that's going off the pitch mm. giving the role for that badge in every single match for the fans for the club for the history you know they're giving them everything so I just think they deserve a full support so you know I don't know what we could do that, that would be meaningful if I, if I can put it to you obviously if we've 
suggested the turning the backs maybe I'd, I don't think it would work I don't think it's enough people would be on board whether that's mm. chanting actually inside the stadiums rather than us all just saying this on podcasts like this and on the radio and social media I don't know what it is that's going to actually make an impact really because I think basically you know we can't help we can't change how the club is at the moment the, 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 with the the financial state of the club, we can't change that. Not unless you know we, are, we you know there's some rich folk, extremely rich folk <laughs> fans that could go. Yeah, all right, I'll buy it off you. See ya. But you know, you know, he, obviously Mel said, oh yeah, I'd be interested. In, in, you know, it won't, you know, if 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 a, if a fan consortium wants to come together, they, I'd be listening to them. You know, I thought, well, of course you will, Mel. You, at the moment, you look if you if you try to get rid, of, try to sell the club to Eric Alonso, you get rid of it to anybody. Let's be honest. <laughs> Yeah, you know, best interest at heart, at heart for the club. You even attempt, you know, when you when you look at that Al Jazeera documentary and, he, and he's dealing with Christopher Samuelson. Yeah, all right, mate. Bit dodgy. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't sit right yeah. at me. For me, I've said it all along. This has just been a business venture. It's gone tits up for Mel, and now he doesn't want to pay anymore. That that mm. that's how it feels. That's just, I, I could be wrong, you know. Obviously, I think from the the meeting that they had, it, it, it's different. You know, you know, he's quite happy to still pay, but I I don't think he does. You know, Mel Mel's been a PR 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 king since he came into this club. Everything's been about PR. Lampard was about PR. Rooney was about PR. For me, I don't even think Lampard. I don't. For me, I'd say Rooney and Mel Morris don't even get on anymore. Do you know, just the way Rooney's spoken all all through preseason. I just think he's had enough. You know, we, he, I've, I, a lot of people wanted Rooney gone, me included, at the end of last season. Get rid of him. Yeah, me too. Uh, I've changed yeah. my mind. Me, yeah. Yeah. You've you've got to be right behind him now because at the end of the day... His hands are tied. I think we're now seeing how bad it is and yeah, what the shit yeah. he's got to deal with. And to be honest, last season, even though we're in a dire situation, I still slated Rooney because I thought... I'm not seeing any signs of good manager there. Whereas this season, every single game we've we've been the better team for large periods of the game. We're creating chances. We're playing, you know, free flowing football. Mm. If we could cut out the individual errors and be a bit more clinical in front of goal, imagine how good we could be. But obviously, well, as we say, Rooney he's not got one hand behind his back. He's got both hands behind his back. And yeah. Shout out to Curtis Davis as well. His comments after the Huddersfield game even oh. hinted towards the fact that. He was signing for a club with a grimace on his face, I think he said. He obviously mm. he didn't go into detail. He's on Prigging Rams TV, but mm. you could tell that he was, you know, he's been here for a few years now. He's got, it's the longest is, time he's been at a club. Yeah. He's got a lot of affiliation with the club and you could tell he was disgusted by the way the club's been run. Because at the end of the day, mate, Curtis Davis, people like that, understand folk like me and you more than what Mel Morris and, and Stephen Pearce do, either that or, or they do understand us, but they just don't care. You know, in business, when when you're selling a business, like, you always got to think, am I leaving this place in a, in a, in a better condition than what I found it? Mm. Can these guys say that? No, not at all. And considering that Mel Morris in particular is, is mental of the club, it's disgusting, really. But, guys, this is why you need to listen to this podcast because Simon's told me if he gets enough views and gets enough money from this podcast, he's going to buy the club. So it's not all <laughs> negative. Yeah, well, they've had one ball, though, and why not have another? <laughs> I do it properly, though. I'll make sure I've got people that know what they're doing next to me. I, I, like I say, I, I, you know, us fans will always judge an owner. I'm not, you know, but we could be running it ourselves me, I wouldn't have a faintest idea, but you've got to look at Mel's background. You know, Mel's come from big businesses, big, you know, he's a multi-millionaire, you know, and yeah. it, people are rich for a reason. Not always, you know, they don't always do things you know, legally. Let's let's be honest. Um, you know, not so I'm not saying Mel's ever done anything illegal or anything <laughs> like that, but they know they know how to play the game, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, of course you do. You know, so it's you know, obviously he was involved, he was a shareholder before he took over. And for me, it just felt like, oh, I'm in a good position here. Look at that. We just lost a, a, a playoff final. I reckon if I buy this club, this club's going forward. Steve McCarron will get this guy, will get this club prom uh, promoted, give it a couple of years, get us established in the Premier League, and then, wow, I can sell for a fortune. That was the plan. You know, he came in, he said he's got, I wish I could, I think I'm sure it was on the fan, at the fan forum, he said he's got a five-year plan. 
Um, and it was just like, wow, well, five years is running truly up now. And you, you just can see it. It's all falling apart for him. And, you know, he, I just think he's he's stubborn. You know, when I think, I think uh, if I read it rightly, I think it was uh, the guy who used to own Liverpool, his brother or something like that, came in to buy the club for 50 million. But he didn't want it because he wanted 60. And you're thinking, that was your opportunity. You know, there was an opportunity there, which you, you know, you, I would have thought it would have been a good time to sell when the club was, you know, on the up, but still in the in the in the in the championship. But you're thinking, okay, bit of investment when it might take us over the edge because Mello, oh, yeah, Mello overspent and yeah, it's just it's just it's sad how it's come all crashing down and it. You know, you, you never think it's going to happen to your club when you think of the likes of Berry and and, and Bolton and, and those clubs, uh, Macclesfield and things like that. You think. That's nah, never gonna happen to my club. Never, never. Look at those; we're a big championship club, fans of the of the EFL. Oh, well, look where we are now, you know. And it, it it's it's so upsetting. It's so frustrating, you know. And when you, I, I've been, yeah, I've spoken about, you know, talked about this you know, this situation with different people every single day for the past God knows how long. You know what's going on. You know where we are. What you know? What's going to change? How how does this all end? Because this has got to end at some point. You know, when John Percy pulled that article out, it said we're looking we're looking at facing a points deduction, twelve with a suspended of three. So you're looking at nine. You're thinking, can we just get it over with then? Because I've, I've there is some people that go, no, we need to fight this to the end until we get away scot free because we did nothing wrong. For me, I've had enough now. I'd rather them just go, right, okay, we'll take the points deduction. Because as a fan, this is horrendous. And you can tell when you look across social media, other people are feeling the same as you and thinking, no, this needs to stop now. I tweeted that out. Would you, you know, if, if it, uh, something like I did a, a, a poll or something, or I didn't even do a poll. I tweeted it out saying, Yo, just take the hit. You can't, you're not going to beat them. They're going to they're carry on. You're going to carry on. At some point, some this needs to stop and this needs to end. And I, I got over 400 likes on that post. So there's a hell of a lot of people that are feeling the same. And, I, I, you know, this cannot continue. Like, obviously, you said you're worried that it's going to, you know, continue for the, for the rest of the season. It can't. You know, I'd rather us go, I'd rather, for me personally, I'd rather Mel went, right, okay, we'll take the nine points and we'll deal with it from there. You know, let's you know, t let's lift this embargo. We could potentially get freebies in before January comes. We could look at, you could then look and go, well, what budget have I got? Have I got a budget? If not, we look at freebies again in January or loans in January, and we just fight. We fight because the players have been fighting since day one to, uh, this season. And that's something that we've not seen, I feel, in, 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 a, in a long time. It's players that are willing to give up everything for that shirt. Play for that badge. Play for the fans. Play for, play for bugger all wages, let's be honest. But they're there and they're doing it. And for me, I think this is why this squad is... Actually, you can see this squad is really close-knit, really tightly bonded. Because there's no big egos. There's no blokes there, you know, players there on massive wages. They're all on a similar wage... They're all fighting for one thing and they're all fighting for Wayne yeah. Rooney as well. Yeah. I agree with your sentiment. I would just love this to be over as soon as possible because, as I say, I do have a horrible feeling that it is going to drag on through the course of the season. But I just do think a nine-point deduction, I get what you're saying, if we can do a bit of business and maybe, but I just think that is relegation. Six points, I mean, with a way of looking, maybe we could still overcome that. But nine points, I just think instantly it just brings the morale of the club and the fan base right back down to where from where, at the minute, after the start of that, in terms of actually when we're yeah, yeah. watching the lads on the pitch, we're actually on quite a high, you know. Mm. This 16,000 we've been getting, I know it was more than that against Forest, but as you say, I'd take this 16,000 over 27, 28,000 in the good times because at the end of the day, everyone in that stadium it, is people like me and you who, who mm. just love to come and will be there. You know, if we was in League 2, me and you would still be there. Yeah. But 
I just don't know. Well, I mean, mate, I think you've probably got to ask yourself the question, is it worth going down to League One? I mean, short-term, paying for long-term gain, really, like going down and getting new owners in and rebuilding the club from there. But it's it's all right saying that, but you look at a huge club like Sunderland, they've been Portsmouth. in League One for Port, Portsmouth, the prime example, mate. They went to League Two, even. Exactly. Uh, I mean, Sunderland, the fourth year in League One now, it's not that simple as saying, oh, we'll go back down, but rebuild, we'll bounce straight back up. We, we could spend 10 years in League One for all we know. Yeah, it, 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 you can, and you know, to me, you know, I, I, I personally think if we do, if we did go down to League One, we wouldn't come straight back up. I mean, no. I look now, if we took a, if we took a minus nine point deduction now, we'd be on minus three, sat bottom of the table. But then you look at it to get out of that, you, you just need two wins, more than whoever's, you know, more than Redden, I think, is at the moment. But and that's the case, that situation for me at the moment. I think if I think you know, yeah negotiate try and negotiate with the AFL but the thing is we don't the whole point the whole thing about this again is we don't know what the points deduction is for mm. you know what I mean it's just, no communication exactly what you know and what's the points deduction for is it because because we've been fined from our, um, our amortisation policy does that mean that our accounts are, are wrong you listen to Kieran Maguire he did a podcast with me and we found 30 million seems legit seems legal you know, it's, it's, it was in a, in a reservation account or I can't remember, it was a reserve, reserve account, something like that from a valuation of property. It was an extra 30, 30, 40, 40, yeah, 30, 34 million, something like that um, from the original valuation of our old stadium. That, and, he, and he was adamant if we use that, we'd be clear of it. So, again, there's been no clarity of what this deduction is for. Now, John Percy, obviously, he's a you know well-respected journalist. He's got a couple of things wrong recently, or mainly the bees that I take over, which, in fairness, Stephen Pearce came on Radio Derby went, oh, no, it's just about done. Don't you worry about that. And that's coming from the club. You know, John Percy, for me, I think gets most of his stories off Mel directly. So, he's you know, that that's come out. And you're thinking, what for? What... You, we need more explanation about it. Surely if you're a club and you go in, you know, there's a minus 12 point deduction potentially heading our way. Well, fans are going to ask what for, but then for them to, oh, it's all, all confidential. Is it? Every other club that's had a points deduction has been told about it. And the reason why, why are in we any day, different? This is people's livelihoods. It's not, you know, supporting Derby for for us fans, it's not a day out us going to the football. This is our life. Yeah. This is our this is our love. I know that sounds sad, but this this is our love. And you just you're playing with people's people's emotions or people's lifestyle here by you know, we 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 don't know what is there gonna be points deduction, are we gonna stay up, are we gonna be in the championship, are we gonna be in League One? We we just don't know. We're left in the loop, as I say, we don't we don't have a clue what's going on at the club and this I don't know what the way back is to be honest from this at this mm. point I, if you had, if it was a minus three points deduction I'd take it like that yeah, uh, yeah just but nine fine, points whatever the nine, nine points, points are in huge trouble yeah. huge trouble I, I think I would I would hesitantly accept six but for me nine I, you know I think would be too much twelve 12 almost guarantees his relegation. Yeah. You know, there's, there's talks of administration. You know, Mel, Mel might put us into administration. Well, that's automatic 12 point deduction. You might as well say kiss goodbye to championship because we'll be in League One. However, if that happens, yeah. at least you know a takeover is going to happen. You would have thought, do you know what I mean? Because you're thinking, well, we can get them on the cheap. Might not be able to keep them in the league, but again, it's one of them, isn't it? But yeah, I, I think. I, <laughs> Me personally, the minute you know, I've heard things about takeover. I can't. I'm not going to discuss it. I'm not. You know, I can't do it. Um, you know, and but I just think at the moment, you know, things are being said about the takeover. Where we're at with it, to me, they're being said to me where we're at with it and stuff like that. And I still think administration is going to happen. I just think that's where we're heading at the minute because I think Mel's got too much debt. I think any potential buyer that comes in and goes, Jesus. Because yeah. it, for me, I think Mel has to stay on to pay his debt. Mm. Especially watching mm. that Al Jazeera documentary as well. And he even says, well, I could stay on as a, you know, but just a small shareholder wouldn't mean anything, you know what I mean? And uh, I, I could pay my, my debt off like that. You're thinking, he's still going to be here, isn't he? 
And I just think that that's that's what, what's going to happen. So he will still be here, but it you know, to me, I just uh, I just hope he doesn't have a uh, you know if he is here, he's only here to you know he, he he's only here to pay off his debts. That's it. He doesn't have a say in the running the club or anything. But what this club for me, if this club, if or when let's say this club gets taken over, it needs a proper board, not just Mel and. Uh, Stephen Pearce and obviously Steve, Roy McFarland who you know obviously is there because he's obviously a Derby County legend it, it needs someone that's going to run it this club properly that means you know like I say CEO all the all the directors that other clubs have that sort of thing you know yeah. um, director it, of football etc yeah I mean we've got obviously McLaren who's apparently a director of football but he's not on any of the uh, he's not on any of the, any company's ass as a director so you know what I mean? It's a bit of a a. Well, if he's director, surely it's just he's a done. title, isn't it? Well, let's yeah. be honest. It is just a title, so I, I think he's. You know, I, I I don't know. Maybe he's on a different salary. I ain't got a clue. But for me, if you know it, that that's that's something that needs to happen. In, and obviously, communication to the fans has to be approved tenfold. You know, regardless if we're doing well, yeah. You, if we're doing well, Mel, Mel's on there every day already. Radio Derby on and, or, or talk sport. Having a good chat with Jim White. You know, he's good, mate. But this is it, you see. Not the, the, Jim White is obviously his friend. He'll go on TalkSport because Jim White won't pressure him. Radio Derby, uh, you know, Derby and Telegraph, they are getting absolutely hammered by our fans at the minute. Um, and it's it's wrong. No, You know, I'm sorry, but it is. Because they are there. They are asking questions. You know they are trying to get answers for the you know for the fans. You know Ed, I think Ed, Ed Dawes alluded to this the other day on Radio Derby. Again, someone came at him on Twitter. Um, you need to be tough. You need to be asking tougher questions. And he says that we are every day, but we're not getting any answers off them. They are not giving us anything. And the only people that I think that know anything again, you know, the only that I've been told as well. Staff members haven't got a clue what's going on neither. And for me, that says exactly where we're at. This is the Mel and Stephen Pearce show. Maybe even Stephen Pearce hasn't got a clue what's going on. Who knows? Maybe it's just the Mel Morris show. I, I saw rumours that staff hadn't been paid. Again, that's 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 false. I'll, I'll say that now. That that's false. <laughs> they have been paid. I've been you know I've had a word with a couple of members of staff. Not going to say who, but they have been paid. So that's that's a false rumour. But for staff not to know if they're coming or going, what's going on, it, it, it's ludicrous. You know, it, it really is. Communication is key in all businesses. Yeah, for an owner of a business, it's easy. It's easy to speak and do all these interviews and everything when when the football club or any sort of business is doing well. But just like on a pitch when it's... <clears throat> It's harder to take the ball when you don't want the ball, if you know what I mean. When yeah, you're not, yeah, I get what you're saying. When you're not doing well, you've been closed down quickly, the pressure's on. Mm. Same thing for an owner. It's when 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 the club's not doing so well and when you're getting a lot of criticism from the fan base and there's uncertainty, that's when you've got to come out and talk just as much and give clarity and yeah. reassure us. Just, just tell us what's going on. Even if you're not reassuring us, even if you're going to come out and say, yeah, what? Well, the club's in a shambles, the future's uncertain at the minute for, you know, we're under embargo for these reasons. Do you know what? Fine, I'd respect that. At least you've been transparent with us yeah, yeah. and communicated openly, yeah, which yeah. is what any owner of a football club should do because at the end of the day, I go back to what I said at the start, we're not customers, we're fans. This, yeah, yeah. this club means a lot to us. Mm. Exactly. It does. You know, we are, we, we are fans. You know, we, 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 yeah, we we're not the consumer. We are the consumer in, in in that sort of sense, but we're not. You know, this is this is life for some people. This is this is their getaway. This is you know, they, they work Monday to Friday. Saturday is their day where they get away from the wife, get away from the kids. <laughs> that sounds like me, actually. <laughs> you know, ha have a bit of their time on their own. They want to yeah. come and support Derby County. You know, some of them have been doing it for years. Some of them have been doing it for weeks. It doesn't matter. Some of them don't go to the ground every, you know, every game. They're still a fan, and this still affects them. There'll be people who suffer all week, you know, Monday to Friday, and they might feel like killing themselves. Yeah. 
but going exactly. to Pride Park for a couple of hours on a Saturday afternoon is their salvation. It's a therapy, it's what they it? live for. It's a little bit dark, but at the end of the day, I'm sure that's true for a lot of people. Yeah, exactly. So communication must be sorted. I think that is the, the end point of that. So we're going to try and can we finish on a positive? I don't want to just you know, we've obviously had a bit of a run there for about half an hour. Um which was coming regardless. Yeah, I, I think you know, I don't I, Maybe another, probably another the other podcast that's been done as well. But can we finish on a positive? You know what? What's what's your biggest positive from the start of this season? The lads' performances, the commitment, the togetherness of the group, the mm. spirit that's in the camp, and how we're actually performing on the pitch. Now we've obviously just been ranting and raving about the state of clubs in off the pitch, mm. but look on the pitch. There's a lot to be positive about. As I say, Huddersfield. Well, a draw was a fair result, but we played really well in that game. Peterborough, we should win that game all day long. It's two individual yeah. errors. Hull, we played really well. Middlesbrough, we did okay. And we should have beat Forest. So, look, that's all five league games where the lads have actually done us proud and we could have actually been coming away with, with more than six points. So, mm. there's a lot to be positive about in terms of on the pitch. If there's not a points deduction, I don't see why this team... Once all once we get our players back, as in Richards, Bielik, etc. If in January, if I know it is a big if, if we could get a couple of maybe loan signings in for the last few months, mm. there's no reason why we couldn't push for say a solid mid-table finish to where yeah. we're looking at a minute really. So that's the positives really. Rooney, I'm starting to see some actual coaching now. As I say, the football playing and creating plenty of chances. They're mm. all right behind the manager. And the fans, look, to all those fans that have, that have been at pretty much every game and getting right behind the boys, keep it up because they're going to need it this season. Unfortunately, as I said at the start of the show, I do think this shit show is going to drag on for most of the season, to be honest. So, yeah. but just carry on, carry on getting behind the boys and just try and, just try and be positive about it all, really. And hopefully, in the meantime... This off the pitch stuff. Hopefully, the, the ownership situation can be resolved as quickly as possible. Whether it will or not, as we just spoke about, we won't get into that again. But yeah. let's just hope that's all any football fan can do. Really, mate, You've just got to hope for the best this season. Yeah, for me, for me, was the 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 game changer was that Salford game. I know people don't say, "Well, League Two, yeah, it was a League Two side that we went two 0 down against." Yeah. We, and, you know, we had a lot of academy players playing in that game, yet we dug in and came back and, you know, got the you know got the draw and then eventually got the win on penalties. For me, that showed that a turner, a, a, turner, a corner had been turned yeah. how it, within the players' attitudes. Because last season, I felt if we went 1-0 down, that was it, game over. Yeah. We went 2-0 down in this game. We come back and, yeah, we got the draw. We could have won it, probably should have won it. They had a bit of an unfair penalty. Um. And I know it's only League Two, but for me, that show where the, the players' attitudes are, they will not stop fighting for this club. You know, and for me, that, that says a lot. Because, like I say, because I you know everything that's going on, that says to me a hell of a lot. And, you know, long may that, long may that continue, you know. And obviously, we've got Birmingham next, next Friday. Why you th- what are you feeling about that? Feeling positive about that? Jack, can we go there and get a result? I know Lee Bowie's doing some good things there, but what are you feeling? Yeah, they've had a good start to the season, haven't they? They've been fairly decent. I watched them in the first game against Sheffield United and they did look like a good team. Mm. I know a lot of people are predicting that they're going to do quite well this season. But look, the way we're playing, I see no reason why we can't go there and, and nick a result, really, whether that's a point or whether we could nick three points. That would be nice considering a possible deduction. We need to get as many points as possible. But yeah, yeah the way we're playing, I don't think we're going to... We're going to go there and get beat. I don't think we'll quite beat them 4 0 like last season, I think it was. But yeah. we can go there and get a result. Tom Lawrence, I'd probably be tempted to keep down the middle, even if Baldock's back, to be honest. I thought mm. the fluidity of that front four against Nottingham Forest, I really liked. And yeah, Lawrence's close control and his one two touch game, I thought was really good. And you know, as we are considering they're running in behind has been excellent as well. So if we can keep that front four together mm. with Ravel there as well, all linking up, then that could cause problems against yeah. a lot of teams, to be honest. So yeah, I wouldn't really be changing anything for that Lawrence, game. Lawrence has set his stall out with that performance now, I think. That's his that's his marker. That's yeah, what he's got to achieve every game. What do you what do you make of the decision to make him captain? It's a controversial one, wasn't it? I sort of 
Extremely. I wouldn't have done it. I thought he'd gone for a safe choice like a Curtis Davis. But you looked at it and I actually compared it to the Jack Grealish situation where he was, he's a young lad at Villa. He'd been, you could see his talent, but he'd been very hit and miss over the years. To give him that captaincy, to sort of give him that extra responsibility and bring that maturity and consistency out of his game. And it proved yeah. to be a genius decision by, yeah. by Dean Smith. And you just hope that that can be the same with Tom Lawrence. And he's, he started the season, like he missed a couple of games, didn't he? But the couple of games he's played in, he's, he's started off pretty well. So let's hope it can prove to be a good decision. Just like bringing Ravel Morrison in. When he first started training for us, I saw what's it and thought, why is the penny not dropped with this guy yet? He's 28. Why are we giving him another chance? But touch wood, that's looking so far like a good call as yeah. well. So hopefully both of these decisions pay off. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I agree. I think I, it, it it did shock me, not going to lie, when I thought, well, you've got the likes of Curtis Day with uh, Jagielka and all that. And you're thinking, well, actually, you didn't have Jagielka when you made the decision, but you're thinking, Tom Lawrence. Maybe it was the fact that, you know, we weren't sure what players we were going to sign, who we were going to get in. So it was, are you for real? <laughs> right. For those who are listening to this, <laughs> Regan has been sat in the dark <laughs> for the majority of this show. We're now coming to the end and he's literally just turned his light on. It wasn't as dark as what it looked. My camera's an absolute bag of crap. But yeah, oh, we've got to show that little pride part me. picture in the background as well, haven't we? So for those of you Beautiful. watching on YouTube, I'm very sorry about that. He does have a light switch. <laughs> doesn't know how to use it. <laughs> but yeah, Tom Lawrence, captain. Uh, yeah, very controversial decision. Um, but... Yeah, I I I, I kind of like the uh, the analogy with with Grealish there. I mean, Lawrence needs something to to really give him a kick up the backside. I think. Um, yeah, and this could be it. This this could be the the thing that does it for him. So, but we shall see. But yeah, anyway, Birmingham then score prediction. Come on, hit me. Not not obviously properly, but we you score prediction. <laughs> uh, do you know what? I don't think we'll get beat. They're a good side. I don't know whether we'll take three points off down. I'm going to go 1-1. One, 1-0. One. One, oh, oh can I, someone's going with a draw on my my show. Oh, no. Right, okay. 4-0 um, <laughs> Derby. No, you've said 1-0 now. Said one all. We'll lock that answer in. Right, I'm going to go. What should I go? Yeah, I think they're a tough side. I mean, I look in their fixtures. They've only really lost. I think they lost against uh, Bournemouth and Fulham, haven't they? So they've had a couple of mediocre fixtures like Luton, I think, Barnsley in between that. Um... Oh, you know what? I think I think I'm going to, I'm going to copy the whole result. We'll go one 0 Derby. I think we'll go. I think we'll go there. And get a, get a result. We seem to do all right at St Andrews, to be honest. So, yeah, I think I think we'll go there and get a result. Get one 0 uh, Tom Lawrence bag a bag of goal. I think. Do you know what? If I wasn't worried about us getting points taken off, I'd, I'd take points. To be honest, away from mm. home. But as I say, the situation we're in, we need to get as many points as we can before before yeah. we get any taken off us. Yeah, yeah, we do definitely, and I agree. You know, we just don't. We just it's just what the future holds in it now. So we, we have to, I suppose, look. What I think what we need as fans to do now is just look forward to every game. Try and ignore the 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 the, the, the crap that's going off behind the scenes, and just just concentrate on what's going off on the pitch. You know, so let's just see where we're at. Get behind the lads up. We have been doing all season. You know, even travelling fans have been amazing as well. You know, I think we're doing a really good job as fans. And, you know, just get behind the team. So, but yeah, Regan, thank you for coming on the show, mate. It's been a great chat. Remember, everyone, you can follow Regan on Twitter at PubTalk Football One. That's football with one L because PubTalk Football was taken for some reason. I know, absolutely disgraceful. But yeah, give us a follow there. And um, you can plug always... your podcast as well if you want. Well, mind. yeah, yeah, we do a podcast, and it's uh, it's always nice to interact with um, the Derby fans. I will be looking to do a bit more uh, Derby content during the course of the season. Get Simon back on at some point, and um, yeah, tune in. We do weekly Prem review shows. We do transfer shows. We do the five best, five worst series. Me, myself, and Coddy, my co-host, and yeah, tune in. Give it a go. You might think it's the worst hour of your life listening to where I might be the best I don't know so yeah give it a try if you could magic brilliant and I've always, as always you can follow me on Twitter at Ramsrata Facebook the Ramsrata Podcast Podcast Ramsrata Podcast and if you want to follow me on TikTok which I've found and discovered and oh, no. now yeah well in fairness 
if you want to see videos of me uh, being a goalkeeper, then yeah, go to TikTok, follow the Rams Without a Podcast on there. All is well. But also remember as well, uh, Kitbag, I'm now affiliated with them. Uh, thank you to all of you who use my code or well, use my link for the away kit. Um, essentially, I earn a small commission off those and yeah, that did all right. I have been told, breaking news, that there is going to be some more Derby stuff next week going on. So I don't know if that's training, if it's some of the training gear, um, i.e. The, the, the camo top or the third okay. kit. Mm. So I'm not sure just yet, uh, but I will keep you informed. And obviously, yeah, so thank you very much, guys. Anyway, thank you for listening as always. Like, share, subscribe. I've watched it on YouTube or listen to it banging everywhere um yeah thank you very much guys and uh, as always come on darby